so I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, let's see. So is the first thing comments from the chair? Uh, it's usually the approval of the agenda, but we can accept the oh, okay. agenda without objection. It's usually a nice way of getting through it quickly. Okay. Does everyone approve of the agenda without objection? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, comments from the chair. I, well, just two things that Ariane and I um, are thinking about is one, possibly going back to in person meetings at some point. Um, so I kind of want to put that before the commissioners to see if that's something that you'd be interested in, and maybe just like a once a month kind of thing. Um, and then second is I, we hope that commissioners will feel comfortable giving us agenda items. So we will from now on be asking all of you for agenda items, things that you want us to discuss during meetings. Um, okay, I still don't have the agenda open, Mike, but <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. It's okay. Uh... We would then, uh, the next thing on the agenda is, we, usually it's general business, but we can probably jump right to public input because the only folks that are here are gonna be people who are interested in commenting on the city plan. Right. Okay, so we'll move on to your presentation. Just quickly run through some of our slides for everybody um, to give a background of the city plan process. Um, so we're just going to quickly run through these. It takes about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to get the, the background and a little explanation of what the city plan is and talk about the fact that the chapters are in two parts, just so people understand that. And then what's the overall process tonight? And it can be really flexible. We don't have a large group so we can be really flexible uh, flexible about working with uh, you guys and hopefully we will get um, somebody keeps hopping in and hopping out hopefully that person will get to stay when he gets in so for anyone who doesn't know where to find the plan if you go to the city page the normal Montpelier hyphen vt.org website you can scroll down and there are these big boxes and usually this one's on the front, but sometimes you've got to hit the little side carrot to kind of get over to the to where it is. You click that box, and you end up at uh, the city plan 2024 page. And if you roll down, you end up with a number of boxes. Now, this is the first three that were the, from the first three chapters. We now have three more. So we have six boxes now, including transportation and energy and utilities and facilities. And we also have the additional information, um, the implementation strategies that are linked below. So that's where you get the two pieces of each one. So back, background and history. So for 50 years, we were the Montpelier master plan. Uh, we decided that really this is not a master plan. It's kind of a term of art. Um, it's not really a master plan. It's a city plan. So we've changed the name. We're now going to be calling it the Montpelier city plan. So you may hear a lot of people refer to it as the master plan. Uh, but we're kind of changing the title and hopefully it'll catch on. Uh, it was most recently updated in 2010 and was uh, amended and readopted in 2017. This new plan is complete new format and content. The process started actually back in 2016, so eight years ago, developing the goals and strategies. We worked with uh, commissions and committees to develop all the implementation strategies and then worked with the planning commission to develop the chapters. It's a web-based plan format with separate chapters for each topic. Uh, uh, when What you're seeing now are just um, boxes of, of the, for the web, but there'll actually be a new website and it'll actually be more, far more functional once you get into that new format. But in order to have the, the public input process, we don't wanna have 
a whole bunch of pieces that don't work and do things. So we're, we're cutting things out and reviewing the content separately. So that's why it kind of looks the way it does. And then we also have a new format for aspirations, goals, and strategies with a goal of a more actionable plan. So we really, this was the one of the primary focuses of the new plan was to make sure that the aspiration goals and strategies were much more actionable. Um, and we have a very specific process that we use in a specific format to try to make sure that all the pieces uh, aren't just going to have token um, uh, token pieces to them. So we don't want to have supporting and um, uh, encouraging things because that doesn't actually change anything. We really want to have a discussion on what goals we're going to have and what actions we're going to take, what, what studies we need to do, what regulations we need to pass, what programs we need to adopt. So why is the city plan important? Uh, they're actually not required under Vermont state law, but if you want to update or adopt zoning regulations, you need to have them. Uh, if you want to participate in Act 250, uh, if the city wants to participate in Act 250 or Section 248, we need to have uh, a city plan in order to participate. And it's also a requirement for uh, a number of state and city, uh, state and federal grants. So there are a lot of reasons to have it. Um, uh, but if you want to have a city plan, then you must meet these four requirements. It has to be consistent with the state planning goals. It has to be compatible with the regional plan. It has to be compatible with other plans in the region, and it has to contain the 12 elements under this part of the state law. So how can a city plan be used? Uh, as I mentioned, that you know there are a number of things that are it's required for, but uh, usually town plans can be used as a long-term guide, uh, as a basis for decision-making and programs and investment, as an action plan, which is really what we're trying to do, uh, as a basis for municipal regulations, which we do, and as a source of information. So there are a number of, un, a lot of reasons uh, and, and ways that you can use city and town plans, um, including standards for state regulatory proceedings, which we mentioned, like Act 250. So as I mentioned at the start, we really, Planning Commission came into it with two goals. Uh, the first was for, to give the storyboards, um, uh, to give the public uh, decision makers a background on a topic. That's the storyboards part. Uh, we want to have it as the kind of the broad picture of the idea when we're talking about energy or talking about transportation. What is it? Why is it important? What is uh, specifically relevant uh, to, the, to the city of Montpelier. What are the goals generally and what are we going to, to, to achieve them? So really it's kind of more of a, the storyboards are designed to be kind of the broad overview of things. And for people who really want to get into the details, you would get into the looking at the strategic plan that's a part of it. Um, and those are detailed in the implementation plan, as I mentioned, the actionable plan to achieve the aspirations and goals. So the overall process, uh, 11, this says 11 chapters total, three at a time over the next four to six months. We actually have added a 12th chapter. So we will be going in with three, 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 three. Um, the, the newest chapter is gonna be resiliency. We're going to add that in uh, to the end when, and I'm going to work on it through the rest of this summer. So what we've done is split it into three, four different groups of three chapters. So we already had the conversation about arts and culture, housing, and uh, oh, I'm blanking on the third one that we just had. But uh, we're now doing transportation, energy, and utilities and facilities for the next three. And then we're going to have, obviously, the last six chapters that will be coming online in August and September. Um, and it might be more September and October by the time we get through with everything. And I'll go over a little bit of that later on with the schedule. Um, so each, each of these are going to have three different input opportunities, plus comments online and through surveys. Once complete, the Planning Commission will review all the comments and make revisions to develop a final public hearing draft. And then when the public hearing draft is ready, we're going to go back through and having uh, another round 
of public hearings and council hearings. So this is really an input process, not the hearing process. We've developed all these. Now we want to see what the public thinks. Um, how close did we come? What are the things that we missed? What are the things that we should be working on um, before we go to public hearing? So as I mentioned, tonight's topics, transportation, energy, utilities, and facilities. Each of these chapters, as we mentioned, comes in two parts. There's a storyboard part. There's an implementation plan part. Um, all six pieces are on the website. Uh, each storyboard's in a web-based format and has an introduction, plan context, synergies, which is how this plan relates to other plans, the implementation summary, and who's involved. So all of the, no matter what 12 you're looking at, they all have that same outline for the storyboard portion. Each implementation strategy starts with aspirations and visions and then has goals, which break down into smaller pieces. So the example we like to use is if you had a goal of safe and affordable housing as a vision, you'd probably have a goal of safe housing and another goal for affordable housing because how you, how you would make safe housing, how we would accomplish our goal of safe housing is probably going to use different tools than how we would make affordable housing. So you really have one broader vision that will have a number of key keywords and phrases in it. And then the goals kind of break it into a number of smaller pieces. The strategies are then actionable pieces to achieve those goals. And some strategies are new strategies and some are existing strategies. So you might see some that are um, uh, create a new program to do X. And some of them might say, uh, continue to do, continue to have a policy of Y. So you'll see that when we start to go through them. So this is just uh, a quick to show you what, what we're going to be going into. And we'll actually open each one of these and go through them. Uh, this, uh, this is the start of the transportation storyboard. So this is when I say storyboard, this is what I'm referring to. And when I talk about the implementation strategies, this is what I'm referring to. So these are the, the two pieces. And as you can see on the right, there's the aspirations and the five goals that are associated with transportation. And then this is the start of all of the implementation pieces that are below. And for some reason, that's still the old one. So I'll have to go and double check that one. And so the rest of this, as I mentioned, um, I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint and we're going to go into the storyboards and walk through them. And um, what we're looking for is what do you like or not like about the various elements? Do you have specific comments about the content? Are there topics or strategies that are missing? This is really an opportunity to try to, to feel what you guys are, are seeing and what you're thinking about them. And with that, uh, we'll take some quick questions now, but I will then jump into the actual strategies. Let's see, where is it? I think we have this. And so, oh, there's city plan. We click on our city plan and it takes us to the city plan page, as we mentioned. We can scroll down and we have the storyboards, and we have the strategies. So I'm just going to quickly kind of go through each one. I'm not going to um, try to go into detail. I really want to uh, take some, some questions and input and hear from folks. You can use the raise hand function, and, and we'll see that pop up. So transportation, this went to the transportation committee, oh, boy, early on in the process, I want to say maybe back 2018 or 19, maybe maybe in that time frame. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about uh, the various uh, approaches that we wanted to take with transportation. Um, so we've got the transportation enhancing connectivity and mobility options in Montpelier. As we said, all of them start with an introduction. Um, Transportation is a critical part of everyday life, walking, biking, parking, shopping, delivering packages, 
recreation. This plan this plan moves towards uh, environmentally environmental sustainability and improved quality of life by supporting walking, biking, public transportation, and personal vehicles as a viable form of transportation. And the strategies center on two goals: to cultivate a transportation system that treats all modes of transportation equally and prioritizes safety for all travelers. So that was something the transportation committee came up with as a key and, and second to support a societal shift to a non-fossil fuel future for transportation. So these were the key elements that the transportation committee came up with and are supported in this plan. So the context, the idea of the storyboards is it's worth is these are all developed through GIS. And so we're able to go through and really provide, and if you have these, they're dynamic maps. So you can actually grab and move around and you could zoom in if you wanted to and zoom out, depending on where you want to be, to look at a number of different pieces. Uh, we've got the road networks here. But we also have the, all the bus routes. And you can click on any of these just to get an idea of what we have in the city. And I won't go through through all of them, but you can click your way through each one of these to get an idea of what are our what our infrastructure actually looks like on the ground. Uh, the city has completed two signature projects. Uh, one being the transit center at 61 Taylor Street, and the second one being the, the shared use path, which was recently completed. Uh, we're actually going to have this be, uh, this is actually just a PDF of the map. We actually have a new data layer we're going to plug in. So it is also, it will also be dynamic. This one is not. Um, but we actually have that data layer ready to go. So the city uses a capital improvement plan to schedule repairs. After many decades of underfunding of capital improvements, the city has now fully funded paving and street reconstruction programs. And this means many of the projects in the CIP are not catching up with long overdue needs while sustainably man maintaining our streets. So this is uh, certainly a project that we get a lot of comments on is the quality of our, our streets. Future of transportation must also do better with problems such as stormwater. Um, and so we have a number of discussions on that. So the synergies, um, how does transportation relate to other things, economic development, energy, land use? Obviously it's closely tied to all three of those. We need a fun fact. So every one of these chapters is supposed to have a fun fact in it. It's like, did you know, you know, 50% of all housing units are older than 60 years old. Um, I'll have to find one still for, for transportation. And again, this goes through how transportation is tied to these other chapters. And then we have an implementation summary. And these are the same things that are in the implementation plan that we were talking about. So talks about the the five goals and the strategies and then a brief description, if you just wanted to have an overview of what the strategies are, there's obviously the tables that have all of them written out. This just gives a summary of the, the biggest policies and what we're trying to do. Um, and then who's involved? And in this case, we have two committees. We've got the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and the Complete Streets Committee and the staff at the Public Works. Um, and if you're in this and would like to provide input, you can provide input um, in the survey. So let me let me pause here. I can go in and talk more about the implementation plan as well. Um, and then I guess we can also go and see where, what folks are thinking. Um, I know Kate is here. She'll have thoughts on energy, but probably also on transportation. Um, so I don't know if others have thoughts, or questions right now, but 
I'll just click real quick on. Mike, I put it in the chat, but I guess I'll just ask my question, which is. Oh, okay. Yes. The, it, the public input part didn't make any sense to me because it requires a login to ArcGIS. And I'll have to. How do, how do we do I that? Just know, I'll just fix that one because that it, they were supposed to have disconnected all of those login to GIS pieces, and I think they must have missed the one on the bottom. Okay, because I saw that two of the chapters had that and the other one didn't, but yep, just yep. hoping you can fix it. Nope, that's good. I, when I, we'd been having a problem getting those disconnected, and so I just scrolled through the arc map parts because usually that's where it would pop up, and I didn't scroll all the way to the bottom because I didn't think that was in it, but I will, I'll let the consultants know to get that fixed on that one. Usually there's an opportunity at the end to conduct, to, to put in a survey or just to put in comments. Um, so again, for, for the implementation strategies, this is really the nuts and bolts that I'm excited about. I really wanted to, to kind of push the envelope on as, as planning director you know, how can we make our plans more actionable, more strategic, not just talking about we want to encourage walking and biking or we want to support um, uh, something. We really want to go through and say exactly what it is we want to do. So if we want to increase public transit and shared mobility opportunities and access through integrated multimodal transportation systems, how are we going to do that? Um we actually have an updated version of this that looks a little different and we didn't get it on, but all the content is the same. But you can see that was goal number one. So all of these ones that kind of have the, the number one or the purple star, those are all programs or projects or regulations that help us accomplish that goal. So that's kind of the thought here is we have this aspiration. These five goals help us accomplish our aspirations. And then in some cases, maybe the capital equipment plan only helps us balance quality and cost effectiveness to improve accommodations and safety on all streets and pathways. So that only accomplishes number four. But you can go through and see there are various things. Some of them aren't very exciting, but they're, they're critical to what we do. We want to capture what we're doing already and also what are the new things that we want to be able to do. And the new format, as soon as this comes out, instead of having the implementation up top, it'll actually go through and say, continue, in this case, it would say, continue the capital improvement plan. So that way it's a little bit bolder and shows a little bit more of what, what the program is. Um, so I'll have to talk to Evelyn, because I know we had it. We proofed it last Wednesday, and it must not have gotten it on. Um, No. So these are the various programs, as we said. Um, so we always like to go through and say there are five ways that we kind of, when we talk about how you will implement, what type of strategies, you're going to be usually talking about doing plans. Uh, we don't know enough, so we need to study something. Um, and uh, that probably isn't the case in transportation, except maybe there might be one, I think, that we're talking about um, studying where we would put the north-south route, because we now completed our east-west bike path, shared use path. So we have a nice highway that's safe for people walking and biking to be able to go east to west, but we don't have a north to south route. So we need a study to tell us where that route would be so we can build it into our capital improvement plan. So that's an example of a plan. You can also use permits, that's regulations. Uh, sometimes you just need to regulate things to achieve a goal, maybe safety. Some safety things might require some regulations. We have programs. Um, those are things that are ongoing, not one at a time, uh, which is a project. A project is something you do once. So we're only gonna build one transit center. So that would be an, uh, an example of a project. Um, Doing line striping is an example of a program. We're going to continue to do that every year. We need a line striping program if we're going to um, have those lines out there all the time and have it maintained over time. Um, and then the last thing is policies. And policies are how we use our resources, we being the government. How do we use our 
land. And transportation, this is a lot because all of our roads are owned by the city. So policies are very important to how we manage our our resources. It becomes less in some chapters, more in others, but in transportation policies become important because policies, how we spend our money, how we use our staff, how we use our buildings, how we use our property are all regulated by policies. You don't have to pass a new law to tell the city to plow its streets differently. You just change your policy. Um, so that's why policies are usually a little bit, have a little lower bar to, to change. So um, in transportation's case, we've got two pages um, that kind of break down unified development regulations as zoning, um, streetscape improvement initiative. And each one of these has a priority and a cost and a responsibility um, to try to make sure we can start assigning things to various departments as to who's gonna be responsible for making sure it gets done. Um, so that's a s overview of how each one of these works. Rob. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just, you know, once this section, I was just kind of comparing, you know, there obviously is some overlap between the energy and the transportation sectors, but, um, you know, maybe including a little uh, blurb about electric vehicle infrastructure in the transportation section. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess to save time, I won't hold my comment for the, you know, the electric vehicle or the, the energy sector, but, um, you know, I, I think really maybe establishing some goals for what that infrastructure looks like. Um, you know, like I think right now we have some look from the perspective of maybe the impact of, uh, you know, transportation in Montpelier and like businesses downtown, um, and, um, you know, the electric vehicle infrastructure demand, um, you know, having a state of the art, you know, whatever it ends up being when this gets implemented 350 kilowatt versus 50 kilowatt charging station within walking distance of the businesses downtown someone can come in for you know an hour charge and get on their way up 89 so it's just sort of realizing our sort of position in the region you know of that from a transportation perspective and how that impacts all the other um aspects here nope that makes sense And I'll have to go through and double check what we what we have in here as in the details, whether it's in here, whether it's in the energy chapter. But I agree we should probably have it touched on in both both places. I know at the time this was developed, it looks like we may have already removed it. There was um, obviously 2018, 2019, we were still talking about the parking garage. And the parking garage was supposed to have, had it been built, uh, 50 electric charging stations. It actually was designed to have 50 of them, and we actually had a grant to put 50 of them in. So it was disappointing to not get the parking garage um, because that would have been a, an excellent, excellent place to kind of gotten people in the downtown in a, in a central location where they would have also had the charging, charging stations. But um, that, that didn't happen, but um, we still need to go and look, as you said, to have other, other locations and to have the, the superchargers would make a, a big difference for economic development, the broader traveling public. Um, well, so I guess, you know, as a follow up on the same, you know, vein, I know you're working on the, the keynote section of, uh, resiliency, <laughs> uh, you know, and making sure to sort of weave that back into the, the other sections as, as something that really has a synergy between them all. Yeah, and we'll, we'll probably go back through, as you mentioned, um, we, we talked about the synergies in transportation. Now that we're adding a chapter on resiliency, um, there's gonna probably be an amendment to that section to go and add in resiliency as, because resiliency is gonna be related to transportation and energy. Um, you, you really, we really can't be talking about climate change and uh, the mitigation and reducing our footprints without then going in and also talking about um, the resiliency, the, the positive impacts that transportation, achieving our transportation and energy goals will have a positive impact on our 
resiliency as well. Uh, so uh, energy, there's a picture of our log farm, log road, solar farm. Um, similar to the others, we're talking again about uh, breaking it into the introduction. Um, really, the, the theme for uh, the energy committee and the energy plan has been net zero 2030, net zero 2050. So the 2030 goal is to get the city government uh, net zero by 2030, and then to get the city, um, the broader city to be net zero by 2050. So each one of those has different uh, tools and goals to accomplish those goals. But um, that's been, that has been probably since that has been adopted as a goal, it, it's been a focus for the, the city council and the city itself for, for a number of years. And this is where we're going to try to capture and try to put it all into one plan where we can start to go through and say, all right, th these are the big objectives and how are we going to get there? And this is an eight-year plan. So this eight-year plan is going to over, is going to run over and overlap that 2030 goal. So so uh, we're, we're talking about uh, the impacts of what the climate crisis will result in. And these were, these were in here before, um, and then uh, were added in after the flood. So we got to update a few pictures from due to last uh, July, July 9th, 10th, 11th. And again, like the other, um, like the other section, it, moves into maps because this is, as we said, it's the GIS storyboards. We have the ability to plug in a lot of data. So sometimes we found some of these data points have been wrong and we're working on updating them. And so uh, if people find data isn't correct, we'll start to follow up to find out why. One of the things we want to be able to do is to start to put in the data, data where the data came from as a little citation underneath it. That'll make it a little bit easier for us because if this data happens to be from 2019, let's say, and your rooftop solar was put in in uh, 2021, it might explain why you're not shown. Uh, we don't we don't have it in there yet, but our consultants are working on getting the the data and putting those data citations in there. So that'll help us to either find better data sets or to maybe update that data set or simply to have it as a qualifier that people understand this is data only as accurate as 2021 because that's the most accurate data we have. So um, again, similar to the other ones, you can uh, zoom in and zoom out. You've got the ability to move around in Montpelier to kind of see where uh, where things are, if you wanted to zoom in on your house and you don't happen to be in the downtown, you've got the ability to move around. These are ground mounted solar voltaic. Uh, and then we've got the big highlight up here where log road solar is. That's our biggest solar facility. And there are a number of other ground mounted ones throughout town. The solar thermal systems. This is for um, hot water. There's some biomass thermal. Um, we've got obviously the big one in the downtown, but there are others that um, are also in the area that also burn um, biomass. So that's wood chips or wood. Alternative transportation. So these are our plug-in stations uh, Rob was referring to before. We need to get some the, of the faster chargers um, and have more of them in our downtown. Right now, don't have too many. And this was what we mentioned before about um, some of the facts. This, these are the goals. 2050 fossil fuel will be eliminated entirely and 100% energy needs for municipal, residential, and commercial will be met renewably, and by 2030, 100% of the energy used for municipal government. 
in thermal, electrical, and transportation will be renewable or offset. So we also talk about a few accomplishments. The Capital Complex District Heat Plant is one success. It burns. Um, it was. Uh, it now it was it was diesel, I believe, and it's now burning um, wood. I believe it's it's whole log in this case, not wood chips. And and in the utilities chapter, which we'll get to, we actually show where the district heat lines go. Um, and then we also have uh, net metering, which we've done. Uh, there are a number of places that have net metering. The one thing that we don't have, haven't shown here, which we're going to be working on, is the fact that um, also our with the log road electric, we also have some net metering sites that that are municipal, um, like City Hall, and uh, and the police station, the fire station. So we've done a number of energy accomplishments down at the Water Resource Recovery Facility. Again, this was uh, same as the other chapters. We talk about the synergies. How does energy relate to all these other chapters? Housing, transportation, historic resources, utilities, and facilities. In some cases, they complement each other. And in some cases, they present challenges, uh, like energy and historic resources. Um, Sometimes and we want to protect our historic resources. We want to protect the historic integrity of buildings, but sometimes that can come in conflict if we're talking about, you know, removing 150-year-old windows to replace them with modern windows in order to meet energy standards. So those are the types of conflicts, and sometimes we can work through them, but it just recognizes that they're challenges. Uh, historic buildings were not built to modern energy standards. And then same as the other ones, we have our aspirations and goals. These are the same ones that you would find on the in the table when we get there. And then who's involved? MIAC is our number one uh, player in this. And I, I'm i going to have to add in here because we didn't, doesn't look like we've mentioned him. We have to mention our... Uh, mentioned Chris Lumber's position. He is the community facilities and energy coordinator. A number of these were written, and we tried to go through and catch things, and it's remarkable how many things I catch while I'm reading it now and not when I read it before. So, and here's another one I'll have to fix. So any quick comments on this one before I jump to the story, before I jump to the implementation plan? Is this my moment for public comment? Yes, <laughs> anytime. Just okay. throw your hand up or I'd say wave so, your arms, but I can't always see everybody. Yeah, so to introduce myself for those of you, um, I'm on the energy committee. My name's Kate Stevenson and I'm the, the former chair when I was the chair when we first gave some of this feedback to the planning commission in 2016 and 2017. Um, and I guess my my big picture feedback is that this section feels very outdated um, and hasn't really been updated since we drafted it in what is now, you know, eight, eight years ago. Um, and no one's asked the energy committee for any feedback on this um, since since then. I think the, the latest draft that we saw was in 2018. So since then, the city has completed a, what we call the net zero action plan. Um, we hired VEIC as a consultant to work with us on that, and we published it in 2021. And what I would really like to see is that this section of the city plan is in alignment with the net zero action plan that we've already commissioned and you know are working towards. Um, so this this whole chapter feels very disjointed to me because it doesn't really reflect the current plans. Um, and you know 
I don't know if any of you were back on the Planning Commission with Barbara Conry, who is kind of the liaison between MIAC and the Planning Commission, but um, particularly the way that the goals are stated um, around net zero transportation, I think is just inaccurate and like needs to be worded better because like we can talk about electrification of transportation, we can talk about not using fossil fuels for transportation, but transportation, like vehicles are not really net zero, right? <laughs> um, a, a building that is using electricity and has renewable energy production related to it can be net zero, but you know, it just, the way that it's worded, I think is, is awkward. Um, and I think overall, just like we need to revisit there, there are a lot of references in there to future work at the wastewater resource recovery facility that is not happening. Um, that that whole plan has changed significantly in the last few years. So that needs to be re-upped um, altogether. And so, yeah, I guess my, I, I sent Mike like a long email with lots of detailed feedback that's kind of nitpicky, but the big picture is like, I, I really think we have to zoom out and reconsider these goals that are shown on the, the poster board because they are not the same as what we were working with in 2016 and 2017. Okay. Yeah, and I haven't. And I haven't had the chance to go through those. I believe I sent those to the planning commission already. Um, so everybody should have those. If not, I will resend them just to make sure. Um, but yeah, that's this is exactly the the input that we're looking for, and we'll go we'll go through again. This is the the public input part of not the public hearing part. So this is where we want to hear about everything and make sure that we've got everything online. And our, our plan was to get through some of the public input pieces and then go back to the committees with where, where we get re revisions to. So we might have to, we know the housing committee uh, wants to have a discussion as well, um, but we expect to go back to everybody. So certainly an energy committee would be on our on our list. But at some point we had to start having public input. We had to start getting people's thoughts and we didn't wanna keep going round and round on the wheel um, without first having some public input. Um, so uh, Kirby, did you wanna jump in? Hey everybody. Um, I don't have the same kind of substance offer that Kate did, but but what Kate just said sounded really, really wonderful and helpful. Uh, I just wanted to give my support and tell you that I think you're doing great. Um, and th there's a lot of important work that's going on here. And uh, just uh, joining in tonight and looking over the images and the infographics and stuff, I think things have come a really long way for, uh, for some of these infographics and maps and things. Um, so I just wanted to say that that that's really uh, 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 hopeful to to see that things are going going along well, but that's really just it. Um, not too much substance, but thank you all very much. Thanks, Kirby. So yeah, I've um, I've been happy with how things have progressed on how they look. But obviously, we need to get the content to now catch up with how things look. And we've got to make sure we're telling the right story and make sure we're getting the right information across. Because we can say there are lots of things we can say in this planning context and in this story. So um, what story do we want to tell and are we telling it well are the two questions that sometimes come up. Uh, Rob. Um. Yeah, well, just a couple of things that people just said, you know, Kate said something about being outdated and you just said a couple of times telling the right story. And, uh, you know, I'm reading this and it's like the energy sector. It's like, oh, the reasons why we're doing clean energy is that we have sea level rise and we've got we have all these climate change impacts. But, you know, to be honest, like, and I just hate to be frank with this. It's like really sad to say it, but like, I just don't believe that any reduction in fossil fuels 
at all is going to have any impact on uh, you know climate change as we see it. You know, it's this big thing about resiliency. It's like how are we like the big thing here is about how are we going to react to that? You know, how are we going to like structure our energy and our transportation and all these things in this community that we live in. Um, in order to respond to the inevitable threat that's going to happen that we all have been working very hard to try and prevent by, you know, doing the right thing, but the world has decided not to do the right thing. So I guess the, the story is, you know, is more about a story of like resiliency and survival when it comes to all of these things than it is about, um, you know, the reason we put in solar panels and the reason we're going doing less carbon is because of, you know, our goal in doing the right thing to reduce fossil fuels. Yes, that is still important, but to me, it's not the story anymore. All right, and as I said, the, the Planning Commission will take all of it and we'll we'll figure out how we want to, to reframe it, if we want to reframe it and kind of go from there. Um, But yes, we'll have uh, to go through there and the energy just so we can get this up. Now, um, obviously, Kate has mentioned a lot of these are maybe out of date. Um, I do know we've made a couple of changes. The aspiration is up top. So, um, But really, this was to try to focus on uh, the goals and strategies were, again, to really if you were to look at these carefully, you'd see the first four are focusing on uh, the municipal um, renewable energy, purchase of equipment uh, and heat loads. And the last four are focused on the public. So reducing baseline energy use by uh, existing residential and commercial buildings. Uh, and uh heat loads in existing commercial and residential buildings. So that's electrical, that's heat. Um, and then the vehicle use. So those were the various pieces. But again, we'll have to go through and double check these and revisit these uh, in light of Kate's comments, because I think they're, she's knows a lot more about this than I do. And I wasn't aware aware of the, uh, the the action plan. Or I guess I knew it in the back of my head and it never crossed my mind to go and kind of go and bring that back out. So the net zero action plan, I'm going to go back through, download it and read it and see how it affects the goals and how it affects the implementation strategies that we have to try to accomplish those goals. So again, a lot of these come down to when we're talking about the first four, those are municipal. A lot of those can be, there's a lot of policies that we can do to accomplish those goals. And in the, um, yeah, this one doesn't have a second page. And then the other four are gonna involve pro, usually programs and regulations to figure out how we accomplish those. And I don't know if you guys want me to quickly uh, just scroll through the utilities, but it's really very similar to these, has a lot of the same um, kind of information in it. Uh, it's a little more factual. So our utilities, we have got, well, technically we only have three utilities, but we'll eventually have four when we get stormwater. So our utilities, uh, our water system, wastewater, stormwater and district heat. So those are the waters. And again, it's all based on, you can see where all the water lines are. You can see where all the sewer lines are, stormwater. So we're able to pull in a lot of data. That's, that's the advantage of being able to use this uh, ArcGIS system is we can plug in a lot of data and we can switch out data relatively quickly because um, there's a lot of information that's now available in these systems. And then you can click on whichever one, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, 
we've got the district heat lines. If you want to see where the district heat lines, there you go. Uh, that's where it currently currently goes, and it doesn't look like it shows the background. So not sure what's up with that. Background on utilities is lost. So usually you'll have the roads and the buildings also highlighted so you can take a look at what's going on there. And then same as the others, we have our synergies. Did you know we provide 1.7 million gallons of water per day to 3,100 customers? And same as before, we have our aspirations and goals. These are broken up a little bit differently because aspirations, that aspiration has a couple of goals, that aspiration has a couple of goals because they're broken into pieces. And then who's involved? And it doesn't look like any of these are working for the feedback, but they do for the first three, so. And And again, uh, this the utilities and facilities are slightly different here because there are big groups of them. So these are all the utilities aspirations and goals. Uh, these are all the facilities aspirations and goals. These are all the private utilities aspirations and goals and the non-municipal facilities such as schools, libraries, hospitals, waste municipal. And then these are all of the strategies. So I think I can always jump back in if we need to. I can put us on out of the shared view screens and just kind of keep it open for any conversations. And I can share screens again if people want to uh, ask specific questions about any of the pieces. And I, I see guess, a couple yeah, of names. Know. Yep. Oh, oh go around. On, on utilities, uh, you know, this obviously, uh, you know, you know my background. I work as a surveyor and uh, also on, you know, on, on the DRB and um, just sort of like looking towards the, you know, the next decade when it comes to the installation of utilities and accounting of utilities. It's like there, there's no reason in this world with technology that like when a utility gets put underground that we shouldn't know exactly where it is and be categorizing, you know, where it is. And that gets fed into like, you know, the city's database, like it's displayed in the, you know, in the, in the, you know, in the story map. Um, but um, like it's possible that like our current processes when it comes to, you know, new development and new connections that like, we're not necessarily making that acquirement. It may be happening um, through the various, like, I think great, initiatives within public works, you know, or whatnot. Um, but I just think from a planning and development standpoint, being able to have like, you know, when utilities are laid in, new utilities are laid into the ground. And when we, you know, do repairs on existing utilities that like we, you know, as the city know exactly where they are and have a system at which we can, you know, provide to developers knowing that. Yeah, I think I agree. They're they're doing a good job at DPW about getting all the information now into the database. We obviously have a lot of old infrastructure that is not mapped, so um, they do a good job of getting it in. But yeah, we could also put requirements uh, for the developers to also give us that data when they're installing it as well on their end. Uh, Kate, you had a question? Um, I'm not sure if this falls under utilities uh, <laughs> because it's not necessarily public, but the log road solar array, um, at some point the city, well, we have a variety of options to buy it versus a power purchase agreement. And um, 
it could be that in the next five to 10 years, that be, that really needs to become a city owned renewable energy utility to some extent. Um, yeah. I don't think anyone's paying attention to that. Yeah, did we miss the window on that? I remember there was there was was it in two two places was, where we have two opportunities? Yeah, there's like at year seven, we, which we missed. We missed the first window. Yeah. Year eleven or and then year twenty or something. I don't know. Like, don't quote me on that. Yeah. No, I remember when the first one was coming up that I was trying to point it out to people to say, you know, we got a window. Did were we gonna move up move on that? Um mm -hmm. and it just went by, but it, it's worth checking. Um, yeah, somewhere in the next eight years of this plan, there's another window. Someone needs to do some math to figure out, yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's worth financially worth doing. Benefit yeah, it should that budget. that should certainly show up in the energy plan, but it may also show up. Um, strategies can show up in multiple things. You'll see the the zoning regulations appears multiple times, uh, mm -hmm. designated downtown appears multiple times. So this strategy of purchasing the log road solar uh, array may be one that would appear under utilities as well as under the energy okay. chapter. Or at least like one of those, you know, we need to do a study to determine whether or not it makes sense. Um, so I don't know. I, there are a couple other folks here. I don't know if anyone else um, wanted to ask questions. Uh, Doug, you sent me an email earlier. I sent that on to SE Group, uh, who's our consultant, and they are going to fix the fix the rail line. Um, there, we're missing a section of rail line on our map. So um, uh, Doug pointed that out to us. So we're going to have that data layer fixed. It's actually wrong on the state's data layer, and that's why it's wrong. So we'll contact the state and let them know they need to update their layer too. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for um all of the thoughts and inputs. And obviously we've got a lot of work to do on these three chapters, not unlike the first three chapters, we did the public input on that. And we got a lot of, a lot of comments, a lot of thoughts, and the planning commission is going through and making a number of improvements. Uh, obviously the email from Kate, we're going to carefully go through and look at that action plan as well to make sure we uh, update those as well. So this is all an iterative process for us. Um, we are, you know, as, as much as we're proud of what we've gotten to, uh, we are not so proud that we're not willing to make changes to it. So we are uh, very much going through, continuing to, to make changes, make improvements as we move towards this winter when we want to be ready with a good, uh, as we said, a good document that, um, we feel has the support of the various committees and has the support of the public. Uh, so that way we've got a smooth adoption process. The city plan we have right now is valid till December of 25. So we're not, we're not in a pinch. We're not under, under the gun to get this done. Um, but we, we would like to get this wrapped up early in 2025. Um, we know it gets complicated trying to have hearings during the budget process. So, we're just going to try to get keep working our way through, and hopefully, um, sometime in early 2025, we'll we will have everything adopted. But between now and then, we're going to continue to make updates. We're going to continue going back to committees, and we're going to continue to take public input. Any input over the next six months, uh, even though, you know, if you had thoughts and comments on on housing or historic resources or arts and culture, those are the three we've already completed. They're not complete. If you have comments on those, we will still take more comments on those. And um, we're just focusing right now on these three 
to kind of have the hearings on. And if people have more thoughts, we'll, we'll take them. Um, you can send me emails. I'm Mike Miller. I usually change my name on here. So Mike Miller, it's mmiller at montpelier-vt.org. Um, and we will circulate any comments that we get. So I don't know, Ariane, if you want to close the public hearing portion or pub public hearing, it's not a public hearing, public input portion. Um, and then we could talk about what what's next on, on the agenda for tonight. Okay, is there a, do I have to make a motion to close the public input session or, sorry, I don't. No, I think you can just, as chair, just go and say, unless somebody else has input, we're gonna close that portion and move on. Okay, hearing no other input, we're gonna close the public input um, session part of the meeting. But yeah, as Mike said, we'll continue to collect comments and you can email Mike, as some of you have done, and I really appreciate all your, all the participation and comments that we're getting. Um, I think it's great. Um, just look at the agenda. Okay, so we had talked about going, or the next possible item on the agenda is going through the matrix of comments. Um, that we have received. And I guess I do feel like it would be, oh, maybe we should, I wonder, I don't know if we can do this. Can we do the minutes first, just so we have that done? <laughs> sure, you're you're in charge. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, I would ask if anyone wants to consider moving approval of the minutes of June 24th 2024. Just gonna get them up myself. I haven't had a chance to look at them. Ariane, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. Great. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Great. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. All right. Um, so then, yeah, I, I feel like it would be um, useful to go through the matrix. I, even though I was ambitious at the last meeting and... <laughs> I have not actually looked at the matrix myself, I have to admit, um, although I know a couple of you have. Um, but maybe if we could just share screen, and I, I mean, I bet a lot of them will be pretty quick. So um, Mike, if you want to share the screen and you can just take a look.
All right. So this kind of goes through, as we mentioned, it's got probably 70 or so different comments that we've received. Um, the first com column is the comments. Um, obviously, some of you have seen, um, you know, Peter has not been happy about the way I've summarized some of his, but he also has 20 pages of comments on some of his pieces. So we're, I just can't reprint it all. The expectation is that you have reviewed what he has sent. And this is just a little summary of what that person, not all of these are Peter's has said. So, um, you know, concern raised that so much of the plan is written before the flood, we should warrant some reconsideration. We don't say who said these, we just say what the comments were. Um, a staff comment, and then your decision will end up on the other side. So we, I commented in this one, I agreed. Um, we should have, we have a resiliency committee. We should write a resiliency chapter. You guys agreed, we'll add a 12th chapter. So it's in yellow because there's something left to do. Green either means uh, there's no action or you've agreed and we're just gonna go through. So these were the comments. These are my thoughts. These are what you think. Um, and we went through a set of them. Um, a couple of these are things I need to do before we can have you vote on them. That's what the orange is for. And I don't know, I know Maria, you went through a number of these. Yeah, you can see my, I didn't, I wasn't sure where exactly oh, to add there, my There's the notes, input. there it is. Yeah, yep. so there's comments on the blocks with my opinion of what we should do, but it's kind of hard to see unless you're actually on that one block, that one square. So I, I think, think some of these I could have probably gone through and summarized pretty quick. Um, like this one here, they want us to get onto the Northern border. We already have a plan to apply. That's basically done. Um, Someone made a comment, we need to keep artists here on a temporary basis. I think there's an actual strategy that talks about that. So I think that one's actually done. Uh, comment about making them PDF. We've gotten to the fact that we can do those posters can be printed 11 by 17 and they're readable. We're going to try to also convert them into a single column. When we're done, we're going to have a single column printout so they can also be printed on eleven by uh, on eight and a half by eleven. So we do have plans to do this. I should probably make this orange. We have plans to do this. We haven't gotten there yet. The storyboards are more difficult. We're going to look at the storyboards as well to see if we can get the storyboards printable. Um, actually, think there were a couple that were. Uh, Carlton may have show, uh, shared some examples of ones that um, had them where they were printable in 11 or eight and a half by 11. And so uh, we're going to try to work on getting those worked into that format as well. Editorial team to review. Yes, we're working on that. Those are good suggestions. Uh, recommendation on housing board to change aspiration A to read X. Um, So this is up to you guys. This is more closely matches. So the recommendation that was made in number 20 more closely matches the original recommended language I had with the housing task force. Um, and earlier, it was an earlier planning commission that adjusted the language to create the current text. So. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about why we changed it and I'm not 100% sure maybe Aaron remembers, but I think I think it was it was for, we felt like it was like we were trying to shorten things and it felt uh, snappier and we needed, you know, of course we need affordable housing, but we do need a range of all sorts of housing. I think that was why we changed it, but I'm not, I personally am not averse to changing it back. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was just a reflection of trying to tighten things up. Yeah. I think that's right. So do you like how Peter, how this was worded, Montpelier will have an adequate supply of safe, resilient, and affordable housing to meet 
the needs of current and future residents. Do you want me just to incorporate his, his language? Yeah, I don't, how do other Sean, Gabe? Sorry, what did we, uh, I was trying to pull up the housing thing. Oh. Right there, but what is it, what it, what does it say right now? Like that is just so safe and resilient. Is that, what did we get? Hmm. Let me see. I think I have. If I pull it up, then it takes this stuff off the screen. So I just. Okay. I think this was like one of the first meetings I attended. And I think the discussion just had to do with what you said that. We need like we I don't know what the language is now, but that we need a range of housing. And when you only identify affordable housing, it sounds like we're only talking about light tech, whereas we're talking we need missing middle housing. We need, you know, housing for, you know, affluent families. So they'll move out of their housing that they're currently in. They can provide it to other people who could use it. You know, there's that was kind of the conversation. Um, I don't know what it says now. I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us yeah. have any issues with affordable housing, but I think the idea was. We need a lot of different housing types, and so I don't I don't know what that currently says, but I yeah, think what it what it currently says is Montpelier will have an adequate supply of safe and, and flood resilient housing that meets the needs of all current and future residents. So we would be striking the flood, and adding in affordable. So rather than an adequate supply of safe and flood resilient housing to meet the needs, it would now read adequate supply of safe, resilient, and affordable housing to meet the needs of all current and future residents. I kind of, now that Gabe has mentioned that, that affordable is kind of, in this context, limiting, because we, we, I think we do want a variety of housing types. Um, so <laughs> now I feel like I'm now on like the other side of things again, because I think we want affordable housing, but we also, we want all kinds of housing. Affordable housing is one aspect to the housing. Yeah, but I, I think there's a good, I mean, are you adverse to the general policy perspective that within that range of housing, it should all, see, all be affordable to the respective right, Affordable buyers? to whom, I guess, is like, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a relative term, and I think, it, yeah. I think it makes sense. Right. I just... Yeah. yeah. To, to lay people, I think when you say affordable, that's, uh, I, I think they say, like, oh, yes, it's, you know, that some, any, but any person who wants to buy something should, can afford one of the options that's available. And for our context, I think when you say affordable, that a lot of people in planning world jump to uh, like subsidized housing, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, and in a technical sense, affordable it, it doesn't matter. You could be you could be Bill Gates and the question is is are you spending more than thirty percent of your income on your housing? And if you're spending less than thirty percent, then your housing is affordable to you. And if you're spending more than thirty percent, then your housing is not affordable to you. Now, if you have a lot of money, you have a lot more options to get yourself into an affordable unit than you do if you're uh, of a lower, low, moderate income. But affordable really, we really want everybody to have affordable housing. Um, just what uh, somebody who makes a quarter million dollars a year, they can afford much more and still be affordable. They can buy a much more expensive house. Um, but that's why usually we end up focusing on, well, is there enough of a supply of in of, of housing that, folks can purchase in this price range because that's where most of the people are and that's what most of the people can afford. What if, and this is like getting really nitpicky, but what if we just move affordable to like an adequate supply of safe, affordable and resilient housing? So like it's not the affordable housing that kind of is a term within planning world, you know? Um, I, you bring the, bring I the really yeah. keeping it keeping it the way with affordable. I I I prefer to think of this as trying to not be too jargony, and that we are writing to for the lay person, and that we're not saying safe and resilient affordable housing. We're saying safe, resilient, and affordable. 
How about also think about, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. We can hear you. Thanks, Carlton. How about, how about um, maybe thinking about words like socioeconomically attainable, you know, that way we can kind of relieve, alleviate stigmas in all categories so that everybody doesn't feel spotlighted. I'm done. That's it. That's, that's, yeah, that's for the commission to entertain. I like just reordering the words. I mean, then, it, then there's no, you know, because affordable housing is, does mean something, right? Whereas if you just move it, move it, it's still there. We still are saying the same thing, but with the broad affordable, right? The broad affordability, the 30%. Not, not that we couldn't do add some additional language problem if we needed to do that, but I think just I mean, re I, I reordering saying, it. But those, those words just seem dated at this point in like our our environment. So affordable, you know, we've been saying this for, I mean, well, I mean, forever. And so, you know, something where we can give it a break and, and say something more refreshing for all of us, you know, just the social economic thing kind of just covers every background and everyone just can try to find a way to just know that we're talking about them too. I'm done. That's it. And I like I like Peter's suggested language. No, I, I think I, I think it's a good I think it's a good discussion. But I mean, in line with what Sean said, I think that this is I think the language given the Oxford comma that's thrown in like separates out. <laughs> the affordability aspect of it from it being connected to planners world that means nothing to the public but that's a good point for the educator yeah i guess i feel like i'm fine with the three different suggestions that have been floated so i don't i don't have a strong opinion um and I think, gosh, I mean, this shows why the city plan takes so long, right? Because like once you really get into it, it's like everybody has a little bit of a different perspective and <laughs> it's very tricky. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether we should, how to come to consensus around this or how strongly people feel about it. Um, But well, I hear I hear two on Peters. Do we have two more to kind of go with what's in column B, or do we want to just leave it open and say we'll come back to it for reconsideration later? I mean, I think Peters is fine. I I just want to make sure it's not it doesn't get misconstrued in the future. Um, well, it's still not permanent. Planners, like looking at this document, you know, um, it definitely will because it's <laughs> because the words are so dated, they've already been figured out. So, we're just helping the breadcrumbs be laid as usual. And if we want to throw affordable in the middle rather than at the end to make it not next to housing like uh, that's that's very reasonable we can do that and move on i mean i feel like it's we're splitting hairs you know yes. i don't i think yes. this is it all means the same thing <laughs> but right. i mean i guess i would just say like are we there's a sort of a broader question here that i think we're grappling with is like who do we want to ensure that the primary audience is and I mean, my two senses is that it's a, it's to the broadest um, public, uh, um, you know, that we can send it to. And to the extent that planners use certain terms of art, I don't think should preclude us from using terms like affordable, especially in the context of like, oh, kind of a layman's understanding of the, of the term. But I, I mean, I think it's all a good debate. But uh, again, I, I sort of view this taking a step back as, you know, a broad aspirational document that we should craft, uh, you know, 
to invite the most broadest audience that we can get. So that's kind of why I think that the recommendation works for me. So. Okay, well, how I, I don't know. Um, I guess if if I'm okay with Peter's suggested language, and I guess I'll just check in if anyone feels strongly that that's really not the way we want to go forward, then I would suggest we just table this and maybe think about it a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm I'm okay with everything. None of this is strongly for a long time. Um, so, th you know, I'm, I'm not like, this is all splitting hair. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. We just decide which ones are more frivolous than others. Yeah. Well, I, I do like, think it's, it's important hair, <laughs> giving that housing is such a hot topic, but, um, I just want to be, what were you going to say, Mike? I was just going to say, I think I've counted four people that have kind of generally said they're okay with how Peter has worded it. And I'll point out, this isn't just Peter's language. This was the language the housing committee had come out with. So, yeah. and again, this is just, um, this would be just a change and we can certainly go through and change it again in the future. If we have another meeting and we go through and say, you know what, we want to go back and revisit that and change it. We can go back and do that. Um, so the second aspiration, which was, uh, which currently reads Montpelier will affirmatively further fair housing in order to protect all persons from discrimination, promote economic opportunities and create a more diverse and inclusive community comment was doesn't acknowledge or address current shortcomings matters of social and economic justice as they pertain to Montpelier's housing including gen, uh, de facto gentrification challenges faced by seniors homeowners wishing to age in place impacts of rising costs and taxes on low and moderate income persons missing middle in homes that young families can afford to buy lack of workforce Un, uh, affordable housing or of any kind and incremental uh, increasing the number of unhoused residents. Um, so yeah, my thought on that was just that I, I would like to be aspiring towards something positive. A lot of his comments seem to be very, very um, aspiring to something negative or something not you know, you don't really want to aspire to to not have homeless. Uh, uh, you know, to to have not have a to have a negative. You want to try to aspire to a positive. So, and um, yeah, he had language in A and he didn't in B. So it looks like Maria was agreeing with our comments. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with that. He's not giving us a uh model for what he wants to say about those issues that's he's not giving us new language to consider so i would i would agree yeah, and a lot that. of the a, a lot of the language that was in aspiration b about affirmatively furthering fair housing that's it's kind of a funny wording but that's that's a lot of our hud programs are based on that that principle it's kind of a, a housing principle that's out there and that's why we want to affirmatively further fair housing Uh, the, his next comment was about uh, uh, general comments on the goals, except for one, that the goals are not measurable. I made the comment that I am not really in favor of measurable goals. Uh, I, this was just the previous planning commission and others. There's a lot of people, uh, city councilors, staff that I work with uh, are very concerned about having measurable goals. I'm not. I I would rather have a goal that expresses what our goals are and um, then find measures 
as a benchmark as a separate category. Um, and I think I used as an example in here, in historic resources, we have a goal to increase community or the original goal was to increase the community's appreciation for historic resources. We were having problems passing historic rules, design review rules, and the commission felt that the reason we were having so many problems was that people just didn't appreciate the value of historic resources, and we need to make people appreciate them more, and that's why we were doing things. Um, what we have, what we changed it to as the Planning Commission was to increase opportunities for community appreciation of historic resources, which I'm trying not to criticize, but just to the, to kind of show contrast to, I that's not really what our goal is. They the the goal of the planning commission. The reason why they did that was because we can count the number of opportunities. But the goal, in my view, is not to increase opportunities for appreciation. Our goal is to actually increase appreciation, and we may have a different ways of measuring that. So that was my thought. And we have a number of these in here that are very numerical. We need to create thirty new housing units. We need to have uh, opportunities because those are measurable things. Again, that's the what the planning commission at the time wanted. Um, and just reflecting on his comment that they're measurable, it's up to you guys to decide how you want these framed. And that's why I, uh, that's why they're framed the way they are is because a number of times there are commissioners trying to make them measurable and that's why they're written the way they, they are. But if you would want to keep them with the way they are, this is perfectly fine. This is your um, goals. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned in my comment there that I think a lot of the goals are measurable because we're we're not saying. I mean, most of the goals say to increase certain things or improve certain things, and that is something that can be measured whether something is actually increasing or not. Mm -hmm. um, the one situation where you actually put out a, a number, <laughs> I think, gets criticized. And like the, the, the next comment is like, what's the 30 all about? So I think once you start throwing out quantities, like ab absolute quantities, that creates, you need to justify that number. And why is it that number? Why not a different number? Which I think starts muddying the waters a bit. Um, and I think you have a good justification for the 30. But I don't know that there's other that everything can be quantified that way, um, in just in a justified way. So mm -hmm. I think the goals already are somewhat quantifiable where necessary. And then other times you're just saying maintain, which means that you are keeping the same number of X. So I think I don't know that comment was a bit. Um, I think it painted with too broad a brush. I think that. The goals are already leaning towards quantifying our goals. Yeah, you know, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm if I'm off base here, but you know, just looking at other cities that have these web based plans and seeing what out, what's out there. I mean, I it seems to me like the intent of this is really to have something very aspirational, as opposed to that master plan or whatever that concept is. That to me, that's like a staff product that agencies would put together and then you know that's like that's how the city manager would manage that's a very different thing than just saying hey this is this is the direction that we're trying to go not that they're as you say maria they could be measured we could figure that out this could feed into something that the city manager might decide to say okay how do we actually make some steps towards this what's our three to five year goals towards the you know what the community has put together but most of them are very much like hey this is who we want to be right like when i've looked at other ones it's like it gets you excited about the direction that we want to head. That's at least that's what I'm seeing in other other places that have these. I would also worry so about if you're adding, trying to add measurable goals, like measurable to maintaining a mix of housing type sizes, occupancies, and costs. That is that we don't want to be too specific. Uh, we want to leave some room for some creativity in solving these goals. Yeah, and, and conditions change too. So, you know, that mix of housing types could possibly change in 
in two years and five years and 10 years, you know, it just, I think you can also hem yourself in by assigning numbers to all of these things. Future is possibility. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything we have to necessarily decide on here. It's just something to keep in the back of your mind as we review goals. Um, if you look at one and try to think about whether or not it's it's achieving or not achieving what you're what you're hoping for, that was a little bit of the the pushing and pulling that was going on as we were developing these last, you know, whether it was five years ago or two years ago. That was some of the pushing and pulling that we had between what the committees would talk about, what the planning commission did, what staff was recommending. Was try, there was just just a dynamic that was going on between should should these be measurable, should they be more aspirational, and this is where they've all ended up. So if you're reading something and trying to understand why, that's probably where it that's probably why it evolved to where it is. This is just the way that one voted out. We don't need to make any decisions here, here and now. It's just, I thought that was a good one for kind of getting an understanding of the context. Great. Um, so the next one, just because since we've already kind of touched up on it, the 30 number, <laughs> um, I wonder, is there somewhere where we can put the, because I actually had forgotten where the 30 number came from, to be honest. Um, and, and I do think it's kind of nice. I mean, I don't think we'll achieve 30 units a year, but I personally think it's kind of nice to have it in there as like a reminder of just kind of the need and the scale that we want to think about in terms of housing. Um, so I just wonder if we can put the calculation in there somewhere and where would that be? I don't know, but. I guess you don't have footnotes in a city plan, but yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm not like attached to it if there's not a place that makes sense for it, but if like the, you know, if, if we all leave the planning commission and there's a, t or even if, and Mike leaves and like nobody knows where the 30 number came from, just to have it in a place that we can, we can get back to it. Yep. Yeah, and whether that's in, and maybe that's something that we can fit into the um, into the storyboard as opposed to into the mm -hmm. into the strategy, or we can do something in in the parentheses or something. I don't know, um, but we'll we'll search we'll search for a way of doing that because that question comes up all the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be, I was thinking that like, maybe it could be in the storyboard. Um, I like that idea too. Uh, okay. So we had comments on um, that goal. Number two is the only one that really talked about uh, explicitly mentioned rental housing See if I can find my. List on those and. Uh, so um, I had said whether it's rented or owned, the places where somebody lives is home. The commission can consider changing this. So. Um, I, I have more thoughts on this because I think the comment itself is a little murky because um, it's, it mentions rental apartments, but houses can also be rented. Um, I think there there is space here to mention that we could support a variety of home ownership types. I'm not really sure how to phrase it, but it's not, when I first read it, I thought they were talking about apartments versus houses and homes does encompass 
apartments or houses or condos or any other living situation. But I do think I would like to see something in the city plan that supports um, rental housing and home homeowner occupied housing. I don't think it has to do with apartments or houses. I think it just has to do with the ownership type. Um, but I'm curious if other commissioners know how that is usually phrased. Like I keep saying ownership type, but I don't think that's the right terminology for what we're talking about. Yeah, so I think what Peter's Peter's referring to number two, where he says this is the only one that does refer to it because it says a mix of housing types, sizes, occupancies, and costs. The other ones talk about increasing the number of homes in Montpelier by 30 units. I would consider that to be rental, but his, his uh, argument, his, his, what he's making here is that people might not read that as increase the number of homes because they might not think of that as, as, as apartments. The other ones improve safety, health, resiliency, flood resiliency of our homes, increase the number of homes that are universally accessible. Um, so of those, they keep referring to the word homes and whether we should be using a different word. And I don't think he's arguing to change number two. I think he's arguing to change number one, three, and four. I think that the word home is is a very reasonable word to to use in this situation. Do I remember right? Isn't there something in uh, this the storyboard that talks about how many, what percentage of renters we have? Like it's a really high, high percentage. And I don't know where else I would have seen it except for in the web-based forms, like over 40%. Yeah, it's close. It's a, it's close to the 50-50. It's like a 45-55 mix. I think it's 55% owner occupied. So we're already, I mean, we're already doing that, not in this, but we're already in the, you know, background, we're already acknowledging that we have a great diversity in home in home occupancy. Yeah, and I think that's why we we classify this as maintaining a mix, and a mix. Uh, th this mix of housing can be, as we said, types, sizes, occupancies, costs. The the thought being that people go through changes in life, and um, you know, I remember doing this the town plan for the town of Hyde Park. And 85% uh, of all the housing units in Hyde Park are single family detached housing units. So it's, it's pretty much if, if you were, if you can't own a single family detached house, you, you know, or rent one, you have a hard time living in, um, in a town that has that type of dynamic. There are very few apartments for, for young people or for old people or, people who may have uh, disabilities or, you know, there's just not a lot of diversity there for people who have to, to have a range of opportunities to find a place to live. Um, it's just one group of housing, owner-occupied single-family houses. Um, so that's why we talk about a mix and we have a mix, which is why we're, um, we're in very good shape. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of why we, we talk about that as a maintain, we're, in, we're doing well. That's what we hope for is to, to continue to have a variety of housing. And we've talked a little bit about when we did the zoning, also talking about, well, we, we aren't maybe doing enough about looking at congregate housing opportunities because in a lot of situations, those congregate opportunities are the opportunities that some of the lowest income folks, we can get some of the homeless um, off the streets uh, many times if there are congregate opportunities for them where they, they have opportunities, that's basically the motel program, but we don't want to have people living in motels. We want people actually having, having homes, but those are some of the, probably some of the places we're lacking or maybe in, in the congregate housing, but otherwise we have a, a, a large mix of housing type sizes and occupancies. My, so 
I'm going back to, again, that zoning conversation we had and the public hearing where there was this feeling that increasing the number of ADUs would change the makeup of Montpelier as a city and community in a bad way, <laughs> if you remember those comments. And I think here might be a good place to throw in that we actually do want rental housing and that is something that we want to maintain. Um, so this isn't actually, maybe it's moving beyond Peter's comment. Um, and I think goal two is trying to get at that, is trying to get at that we want this variety of housing types. Is there a way to specifically throw in support here for rental housing without it being too specific in this instance? Is there a way to refer to rental housing without, I don't know, making it so... So I guess so specific in this one instance, because we don't really mention it elsewhere. But I think it is important for us to, as a city, to say out loud that we support rental housing. Well, I, I think that that's something that needs to be covered in like the storyboard and then also your, your implementation strategies, right? These goals are made to be broad. Um, and having it be a little bit general is is a good thing. I think. I think the storyboard it would be a good place, and we may end up with a couple of these, as we said. Just number one, goal number one, we're talking about. Well, maybe we need to have that talked about a little bit in the storyboard, and maybe same thing here. We might have to have dedicate a little bit of the storyboard to kind of express support for rental housing. And then it and wouldn't necessarily need to be addressed here in the implementation plan. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, guys. But I think, I think that's I think we we have a more more opportunity to more broadly state that express that support because um, we've also heard you know in, in the hearings a little bit of back and forth from people who you know talked about homeowners and talked about renters and you know kind of like well, homeowners are more you know more Montpelier folks than than the renters <laughs> and it was kind of and people jumped on that to say no uh, you know i'm just as much a montpelier resident as a renter um and so i think we need to reflect reflect that sentiment that you know renters homeowners they're you know they're all equal in this housing plan Yeah, I think that's a valuable comment, Rian. I I want to think more about it and like where we can put it in, but um yeah. Right now I don't I'm not sure what else to suggest, but at least at least in the story words. Yep. Uh so his third comment was again, you've heard him make the comment, improve the safety, health, flood resiliency of our homes. And, uh, you know, his comment was obviously it, more than just flood resiliency. Uh, so there it is, number three. So he wants, he wants climate resiliency, not flood resiliency. So I agreed. I thought climate resiliency is, is fine. We'll be addressing other aspects. It's a very hot summer this year. Um, climate impacts are not just floods. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with using resiliency. I was, I think I'm a little bit confused about where he wants to put energy efficiency. Um, and I think Part of the reason we may have taken some of that language out is just that we felt like it was overlapping with the 
energy plan um, or that, you know, all these things are like a overlapping Venn diagram, right? And just that we had already covered some of the energy efficiency goals in the energy plan, but. Yep. Yeah, I think I think it was initially. I think it did, and the the original one that came out of the housing committee, I think, did go through and say safety, health, flood resiliency, and the and energy efficiency of our homes. But I do and my comment here. I did mention that um, energy uh, as it. it energy efficiency as a housing goal, I think has costs and benefits here. Um, I mean, I think flood resiliency matters because people lose their homes through flood, you know, through floods, but having an efficient heating system will not necessarily cost you your house, you know, um, but it could mean that your house is now unaffordable if your only option is to buy an energy efficient home. So I, I, when I worked at DOT, at USDOT, there was, I mean, every year it seemed like they had to consider school buses and whether school buses should have seatbelts, which is like universally a great thing to have seatbelts on school buses. But the issue is that once you start putting seatbelts on school buses, school buses become more expensive. And once school buses become more expensive, school districts stop buying them. And so they just end up using their old 1980s, 1990s buses which are on the whole more unsafe than anything that you would buy today. Um, and this happens like in aviation too, like requiring um, parents to bring toddler seats or baby seats onto airplanes is like, obviously it sounds great on its surface, but because of that, people end up driving their children to grandma's house instead of flying to grandma's house. And we all know that driving is so much more dangerous than flying. So more children end up dying if you require baby seats on airplanes. <laughs> this is like, you know, so like these like, and this is like, a, this is true. This is fundamentally true. So going back to energy efficiency in housing, if it is a goal to improve energy efficiency in housing, Will housing in Montpelier become more expensive and more people will be homeless, you know, or more people will be inadequately housed. Um, so I think there's just like a conversation to be had here where flood resiliency is so critical because if you put all of your money into this home, whether you're a renter or a buyer and you lose that house, it is such a financial blow. And so many people couldn't even they wouldn't be able to get back up on their feet. But having a fuel oil burning, you know, radiators, yes, it's it's obviously bad for the environment. Everybody knows that, but you still have a home. Um, so I'm curious what other people think about this, this these trade-offs with climate resiliency and housing. I think that was a very well put. Those are good examples, very good examples. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, it, 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 those are great. I mean, that's, that's, uh, it, it sounds like stackable, stackable consequences, uh, to kind of summarize it. Um, I, I think that a lot of this also has a degree of, uh, understanding the larger picture of the U.S. economy and the fact that, you know, COVID stopped the train a little bit. So the money, um, locally, state and federal uh, is a factor. Um, some of the information on the GA, uh, GAO.gov uh, regarding some of the financial things that we are uh, undergoing and are about to go through uh, are some of the things that we just don't have control of. And so this is, you know, this is, we're doing what we can. Um, and so I'm, I'm good with it. So I just put the note here, change to climate resiliency, but not add energy efficiency. Sounded like that was kind of the direction where everybody is leaning. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I'm just noticing it's 728 and I just wanted to um, just touch on a couple more things. So I'm wondering, do we have a place for our next meeting for the in-person public input session? It is not nailed down yet. I will send that out hopefully tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay. A lot, so of, a lot of people are missing. We're trying to get into the senior center and the senior, the, the, there's a lot of folks that are out this week. So I've just got to work around the system. Okay. All right. But it sounds like we can have the senior center. That would be a great place to try, I think. Um, and then I'm also realizing that I'm going to be gone the first meeting in August. Um, so I don't know whether we want to take a little break and skip that meeting August 12th or um, and then resume like August 26th, which I think is the Monday before school starts is how I think of it. <laughs> but um, what other folks think of that? Yeah, Ariana, I just realized I might be out of town too. Okay. I will be in town and I was going to actually ask you guys about the first week in August as well, because I'm going to be in town, except that I'm, uh, that's the, the window of time I have, uh, as many of you know, I bought a house in Montpelier and I'm selling my house in Hardwick and I have contracts on both. And that's my two week window to move everything out of my house in Hardwick and get it into Montpelier. So I'm not going to have time to really be preparing anything, especially if we're trying to do a public input session, that's going to be really stretching me thin because I'm going to be on vacation those two weeks. So sounds like we missed that. Okay, great. So it sounds like we're going to have the public input in person session on these chapters again next in two weeks, and then we'll take a week off. And then I, I would assume that maybe the August 26th will just be a regular planning commission. So we can just kind of regroup and think about our next set of chapters and where we are and maybe go back to the matrix. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Okay. All right. So would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? I have a motion to adjourn. I'd like to second that. <laughs> Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, right, great. So I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you all. See you.